I do a problem every day because it's actually fun. This is partition array for maximum sum. Let's go ahead and get right into the problem. So you're given an integer array, array, or ARR. You want to partition the array into subarrays of a length at most k. Okay, so partitioning an array just basically means for any array like, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. When you partition this array, you're basically just selecting points where you're going to insert kind of like splitters. So I'm going to make these splitters, and maybe this will make sense. So if I wanted to partition the array at C and D, I'm essentially just splitting this array up at this position. Let's put these a little bit closer to one another. Ugh. All right, so I want to make these things a little bit closer so it's easier to point out what I'm doing. All right. If I wanted to partition again at F and G, I partition there, right? So what the array eventually looks like if you just read this out and kind of ensured the formatting was correct would be like this, right? So in this example, I took the original array and I partitioned it into three subarrays. Now for the sake of this problem, when you partition the array like this, for example, they, the partitioned array, right, the subarray you create can have length at most k. Right, so if k was equal to 3 in this example, right, let's say k equals 3, what would that mean for the array that we partition? Well, this would be a valid array, right, because this is one partition, it has length 3k, this is one partition has length k, and this is one partition has length k minus 2, right, because k is 3, 3, and 1 here, right? So that means it meets the constraint versus just to kind of exhaust every aspect of a partition and a valid length partition, this would not be a valid partition if you took this system and you decided to split here. Right? If you decided to split here, well, then the new array you would create after reformatting would be C, D, C, D, E, F, and G. And you'll notice in this example, well, this has length 4. Your maximum is length 3, so this wouldn't work. All right, so that's the general idea of partitioning and having partitions of a certain length. With that stated, let's continue the problem. Okay, after partitioning each subarray, each subarray has their values changed to become... Okay, so we partition the array, subarrays of length most k. After partitioning, each subarray has their values changed to become the maximum value of that subarray. Okay. We're going to return the largest sum of the given array after partitioning. Test cases are generated such that the answer fits into a 32-bit integer. All right, we don't need to really worry about the second point, right? Because we're going to use Python, so the fact that it fits in some, you know, fixed data type size is irrelevant. But interesting if you're, you know, coding in C++ or another language and you have to think about uh, data types. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this example and let's try to walk through what they mean by that second point, which is the partition becomes the largest value of that array. Okay, so we have this example. And the example is the array equals, we got 1, 15, 7, 9, 2, 5, 1, 15, 7, 9, 2, 5, 10. And we have k equals 3. Okay, so 1, 15, 7, 9, 2, 5, 10. And k equals 3. Well, it just so turns out, right, if we played this partition game again, so I'll take this array, all right, I'll put it here, and then I'll put these big red boundaries around, and we're going to make a decision about where we need to split up this array. Where It just turns out, right, that this array becomes 15, 15, 15, 9, 10, 10, 10, 10. So we entered these splitter points, right? I created these little splitters. Create a splitter here, a splitter here. And that's it, right? So if you then look at the system again, so we insert a splitter here and a splitter here. So if you look at the final example, right, you have one, 15, seven. What did I do that? 15, seven, close. What is wrong with me? We have nine and we have two, five, 10, right? And then what happens, right, with this idea is the after partitioning each subarray has their values changed to become the maximum value of that subarray so this subarray changes 
because these values now become the max of the subarray. So what's the max of this subarray? 15, right? What's the max of this subarray? Which is one element, so it's that element itself, nine. And what's the maximum of this subarray? That would be 10. So each element becomes the max of its subarray. And your answer is just the sum of those values. Now, this what I'm about to do following will give you a little bit of a hint of how this works, uh, how the solution works. But you know, since there's three elements in here and the max is 15, I'm gonna do 15 times three. That's what I'm gonna sum from this subarray that I partitioned out. There's one element here with the maximum one. There's three elements here and the maximum is 10. If you sum that up, you get 15 times 3, 45, plus 30, 75, plus 9, 75, plus 5, plus 4, 84. Okay, so you get 84, which is the answer here. So interesting, right? So kind of in this problem, you want to find optimal partitions, and you can create as many partitions as you want, but the partition that you create will define how long, uh, the maximum value which will contribute the size of that partition number of elements to your solution. Meaning, you know, I create this partition here because I put a partition point here. So that'll mean that the subarray that I create here will be length three and it'll contribute its maximum three times, which is 15. So 15 times three, nine times one, 10 times three, etc. So this is kind of a difficult problem because you can get stuck in this trap of thinking about like where can a 15 be right like 15 since the thing is three it could be 15 by itself and you could split at the one right or 15 could go to the right or it could be 15 here 15 15 15 on this side right so there's many places that 15 could end up being the sum so you got to think about this problem in terms of the indexes um, if you want to find kind of a intuitive solution, but it, it's kind of difficult. Um, I guess what led me to the solution was kind of modeling this as a graph because using partitions for one, right? I guess my first observation for this system would be, you know, partition problems, where we're trying to maximize something, usually usually indicates dynamic programming, okay? That's usually what partitioning problems indicate. I've done a lot of partitioning problems in the past, right? This idea of trying to find split points and almost exclusively they were solved using dynamic programming. So just reading this problem, it may be incorrect. My, you may go down the wrong path thinking that, okay, I see partition, so it's probably dynamic programming. But most of the time, that seems to be an accurate um, statement. So I'm going to go and approach this problem to see if I can, if I can consider uh, a dynamic programming solution. So I guess the idea, if you wanted to model this graph, would be to, I guess, think about partition points and optimal partition points, right? Because if we didn't consider this idea of becoming the max value, how would you find the maximum kind of partition points? Uh, I guess not partition points. Hmm. How do I explain this? If you had this system Let's first model it kind of, not as a graph yet, but let's think about partition points when you look at nine. So this is the last index. So let's create a dynamic programming solution. Let's think about the best, let's say our dynamic programming array i for an index is the best partition scheme ending at index i. So what I mean by at index i dx. So what I mean by that is this is the best partition scheme ending at the index index. It essentially means this is the best system that 
maximizes this sum, right? Each subarray has a value change to become the maximum value of that subarray, right? So imagine that it ended at this index. What would that mean for the maximum um, value you could get in terms of a partition? So if it was ending at nine, if the, the best partition scheme ended at nine, that would mean that nine was the last value in this partition. So how many partitions, I mean, what partitions could exist for nine? Well, you know, if K equals three, right, the, the, this can't be a partition, right? You can't have one, 15, seven, and nine together because it exceeds the size of the partition. Does that make sense? Right, I can't, right, right, right. I can't place the left side of this partition here because it would make the size of that partition exceed K. So there's only a finite number of options, right? There's only a finite number of choices where I can decide to put the left bracket to, this, to determine where this partition should be. I could put it here, or I could say, well, I could put it there, or I could put it in this position, or I could put it in this position. But I can't put it in this position, and I can't put it to the right. That doesn't make sense. But I can put it here or here or here. Okay, and depending on where I put it, that'll determine what the value of that partition is in terms of what it provides. If I put the partition here, okay, so we'll walk through each of those. So let's say I tried that first. So I put the partition here. What would that contribute to my total? Why did I do all that? What would that contribute to my total solution if I put the partition there? Well, it would give me nine to my total solution times one because that's the length of the of the system. What if I put the partition instead here? If I put the partition here, it would still contribute nine. Why? Because nine is the maximum value within this partition times two. That's what it will contribute to my total sum at the end. And if I put the partition here, this will provide now 15 total to my whole system and times three, because that's the length of the partition that I've created. And then I would know that that's all I can check, right? I can't keep checking. I can't move this over again because that would exceed the size of K. That would exceed the total size of the partition, right? So essentially all I have to do is generally put, sorry, there's some other work from previous things. Generally all I have to do is think of this system as a bunch of numbers. So if I had the number A, B, C, D, dot, 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 dot. No, maybe not dot, dot, dot. Let's put the dot, dot, dot on the other way, right? And I already know what the valid partitions are, what the, the best partition scheme is for each of these values. So I know what's best here. 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 And I know what's best here. So what I mean by that is that I already have determined the value that I get if I put the last partition ending at this point. Okay. And then say we add an element E. So we're looking at E and let's say K equals four. K equals four. So what would that mean? If I add an element E and I look at a new element, I can add E itself. So this is the new element with the new ending position. I'm trying to find what the best partition scheme is for E. If I attach it here, then that would mean that I would get E times one points plus whatever I get from using D, right? And D is just, the index that I'm currently at, right? If the current index I'm looking at is here, and right, if I'm currently looking at this index, I get E times one, so whatever the value of the E is times one, because that's the partition I'm creating, and then whatever the best partition is for the previous index, right? Because that's this value here, right? So since I've already solved all these blue values, right? I'm assuming that I've already solved all these blue values. So I already know what the best partition is ending at D, the best partition scheme ending at D. I already know the best partition scheme ending at C. I already know the best partition scheme ending at B at A and everything that comes before, right? If I put the partition in this spot, 
then that means I get the points for E times one, because that's the size of the partition I'm creating, plus the points that I get for using the best partition using this D. So I could do that, or, right, I could do that, or I could do, what else can I do? I could take the max of E and D times two, plus the partition at D of index minus two. Okay, and that just corresponds to saying, well, I'll move this over here, All right? So if I move this over here, I'm no longer gonna use D's best partition. I'm gonna use whatever C's best partition is. So that's what I would consider next. And then what I would do is say, okay, or I could use, since this is four, or I could use the max of E, D, and ED. Ah. ED and C times three plus whatever the best partition is ending at B. Right, and then finally, just to make this totally complete, since I can use four, this would be the last thing that I can consider. So I could do the max of E, D, C, and B times four plus D of IDX minus four. All right, so for any point, I can consider all four of these options, right? Because I have K equals four. So I could check any four of these positions and say, well, if I have, so now that I've found the optimal for this point, right? So now this just gets added. So now I know what, what uh, D of IDX is. Right, so now I found what the it's just the max of these things for k equals four, right? That means I now know this, right? I now know what this value is, whatever it is. So then for any subsequent element, I have that calculated. So you can kind of see inductively how that works, right? Now I've solved it for e, so then when f does this process for k equals four, it'll have this e value, it'll have the d value, the c value, the b value, the a value, and all the values before, okay? So another way you can think of this problem, if this um, isn't totally clear, and I, hopefully this is clear, you can also think of it as a graph like this. So this would be the actual graph and the vertices in between them for the example problem that we were looking at, right? Essentially, at any node, right, you can skip forward nodes and go to a subsequent node and use the maximum of that partition. So for the example that we we're using before if the first three things become 15 you would use this system here and then 9 and then the last two three became 10 and then if you just walk through this system with the associated graphs and nodes this is nothing so you have an opening bracket here you travel down to seven. The maximum between here and here is 15. So you get 15, 15, 15 for these first three nodes. Then an open bra a closed bracket and then an open bracket. A nine by itself. Closed bracket, open bracket. All the way to 10. And the things in between them are all 10. So 10, 10, 10, closed bracket. So you can think of the system like that, right? Because for any node, any vertice, you look at the k previous things to determine what can provide you with the maximum solution, okay? And that's just another way of stating this in a graph, uh, graph representation. Um, so with that stated, what would be the recurrence relationship of the system? Well, for any index, right, if we want to look at it in these terms, it's going to be the maximum that we can get for k, right? Whatever k the range for k is, the maximum that we can get for uh, what is the array? So we have array. The maximum that we can get in the array that we're going to create. So we'll take the array from idx minus k all the way to IDX, and this may be one off or something, 
times idx minus k plus d of idx minus k. Index minus k. Yes, you do have to come on. Right? So the basic idea is, is I say, well, for whatever range I'm using from zero, from one to K, I'm going to look at that range and take the maximum element, right? That's what we did here. When this was four, right? We looked at four elements. When this was three, we looked at the last three elements. When this was two, we looked at the last two elements. We got the max. When this is one, we looked at the max of the last one elements, right? We multiplied that by how many elements we were grabbing. So we took the max of how many elements we were grabbing, multiply that together because I would add that to my solution. And then I added the previous solution if we're going to partition at that point, right? Here, I took these four, I, I multiplied it by the max, and then I added the solution that we've already found for that previous point if we're going to partition there. Okay. So this is the general formula. Um, we're going to have to go through all n indices, right? So we're going to have to solve this n times. Right, so if we're looking at runtime here, so this is going to take n times. We're going to have to do this n times, and then we have to look at all k values, so all n times k values. But then when you find this information, every time you look at k elements, right, from one to k elements, you have to look at one to k previous elements to find the maximum, right? So when I try to find this k, I have to look at the previous k elements to find the max so that's another k so that's nk squared so to remove the constraint of k squared is we'll have a kind of prefix some idea that when we solve this problem we'll keep track of what the maximum thing is in the array that we're building that way we don't have to recompute it every time right because what's happening right now is like if we went back here and looked at this again more generally Right, when we're computing this, we start here. Right, we start in this situation and we'll have to find the max of this. And then we'll move this over and we have to find the max of this to find out what the maximum number is we're gonna multiply. And we have to move it over again and maximize some of this. And move it over again maximize the sum of this right so we have to keep maximizing the same things over and over and over again so how about instead to save on runtime we'll just set a variable m equal to e and then when we move something over we'll just update it by saying okay m equals the max of whatever we thought m was before with d so m will be the max still, and then we move it over again, we'll just say m equals the max of c and m. And then when we move it over again, we'll just take the maximum of m equals the max of b and m. So what I'm basically saying is you just do like a prefix idea, right? So every time you shift over one to check a previous k value, right? Like I, I look to see if this was the subarray, then I look if this was a subarray. I'm only increasing the size of the subarray by one, so I just check whatever I th think is the largest, right? Whatever was the largest before with the newest value. And if this newest value is larger, then we'll multiply by that. Otherwise, we'll use the old largest value. That way, we don't have to update the system like this, right? Because this is scaling. We have to compare two, then three, then four. Now, instead, you just say, you multiply it by, you, at the beginning, you'd say m equals e, multiply it by m. Then you set m equals to the max of m and d. You multiply this by m and this by m and this by m. So now you just have to you know, update this value using a constant operation instead of updating it with a value that scales with k. So that'll just save you some um, formulas here. So this will be a fixed value that we can just call the maximum value. Then. So with that, let's go ahead and actually um, solve this problem. Now let's walk through the example problem and use 
this approach. Okay, so we'll have the array itself, which is 1, 15, 7, 9, 2, 5, 10. Okay, and then we'll have this D value. Okay, so for 1, it's pretty easy, right? Because 1 has nothing on its left to even compare to, so it can only be 1. For 15, we look at 15 by itself, you get 15, right? Whoa. I apologize. You know, you look at 15 by itself, you get 15 plus 1, right? Because you would get this array here and this subarray here. Or if you move it over 2, you get 15 plus 15, which gives you 30, right? So if you tried this subarray here. Right, so 30 would be the solution for this line. One would be the solution for this line. If you had 7, you could put the split in this position. Right, if you had 7, you could put the split in this position. And you would say, okay, my largest is 7. And then you'd get 7 plus whatever this thing could provide you with is 30. So that would give you 30. You get 7 plus 30 from the previous thing to give you 37. Or you could put it in this position. And now you said before my max was 7, I'm looking at a 15 now. So now my max is 15. So you get 30 plus 30 because you multiply these two together plus whatever you get in the previous position. So you get 30 plus whatever's in the previous position to get 31. Or you can move it to the last position. And now you have a 1, so your max is still 15. And you'd say, okay, I can do 15 times 3. So 15 times 3, I can do 15 plus 15 plus 15. Give me 45. So that would be the best in this position. Okay, and then we'll go do it for 9. And then from there, we're going to just stop because it's taking too long to walk through this. But I think you get the general gist of what we're doing here. So you can do 9 by itself. You just get 9, right? You could do, you get nine by itself, you get nine plus whatever you get if you split at the previous part, which is 45. All right, so nine plus 45 is uh, 54. Or you could go two over, so you do nine plus nine, 18 plus 30, which is uh, 48. All right, so here's your options you have 54, 48, or you could go three over, and your best would be 15, so 15, 30, 45, you get 46. So the best thing to do here would get you could get 48. You get 48 ending at this point if you use 9 alone, right? Because you got this 48 from using 9 alone and then using the previous best solution. So that's the general gist. Um, let's go ahead and just write the code. Okay. So we'll set D equals 0. Uh, how are we going to do this? There's some weird pointer issues, and I'm kind of concerned that I'm going to mess something up. Um, how are we going to go about this? Let's say a D, let's just make D a default dict so I don't have to worry about now. Make D times length of N, N, which is the length of the array. And then all we have to do is we have to look at each index, because we called it index I, in range length of the array. And then we have to figure out what would be maximum for D, right? And we want to keep track of the maximum value, so we'll set that to negative float infinity at the beginning. And then we'll look at each K range, so we'll call that uh, J DX in range what? You could use just one value, or you could go up to K. But you can't go past K, so... I guess it would be the min of k and the index plus 1. Right, because the idea here is like, in this first example, if k was equal to, if k was equal to 3 here, right, you can't go farther back, so you can only go to 1 itself. For 15, right, 15 can check 1, but it can't partition past 1 because there's nothing to the left. 
So you can only go up to the index. And if you exceed the index plus one, you can only go K backwards, right? So you can only go a maximum K backwards. Here, you can check nine, you can check seven, you can check 15. Here, you can check seven, 15, and one. But when you're here, you can't check, um, you can't go farther than this, right? Because you've exceeded the system. So this min of K index plus one will ensure you don't go too far left. Right, but it will also ensure you can only go at most k to the left. But if there's nothing k to your left, it make sure you don't exceed the boundaries of the array. So that's the basic idea of this, right? You can go at most k, and you can go at most the number of elements that you have, and whatever the minimum of that is, what you're actually capable of doing. So the first thing we'll do is we'll say, okay, is the new value that we're looking at in this range at the array larger than what we think is the max? So that's the prefix sum idea, keeping track of what the largest thing is. And then we'd say, okay, well, depending on what that is, D at this index is going to be not array at K, an array at index minus K. Minus K plus 1, I guess. Right, because we're doing K equals 0 to represent the first element. So K plus 1 would get you one element to the left. Or, wait. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking about this. So if K was zero, it would be an element itself. Yeah. So you do m times is the max of whatever you think the maximum is. And m times, so what's the size of this array? k plus one, right? Because if k is zero, we're dealing just one. If k was one, that'd mean that you have two elements because you're looking at yourself and the first previous element before you. That's what this this JDX value is here. So I called it this, you should call it JDX. So the idea is that I'm going from JDX from zero to the min of whatever K is or the index that I'm at. And if this is zero, that means I'm using just myself. So I'm using zero elements to my left. If this is one, that means I'm considering one element to my left. If this is, if JDX is two, I'm considering two elements to my left, so on and so forth. Plus D of index minus JDX. So if this was zero minus one, because one to the left, right? If, if, if JDX is zero, I'm using nothing to my left. So then I would use the partition that's one away from me to my left. Right? Basically, if IDX was here, right? And we're talking about this element, and we have information about all this previous system. If JDX is zero, that means that I'm not considering anything to my left, right? So that would mean that I do IDX minus JDX minus one, that'll get me to this point because JDX is the same, IDX minus JDX is the same thing, right? IDX minus JDX, if IDX is here, minus JDX equals zero is the same thing. So minus one will get you to the previous element. Very circular way of doing this, but hopefully that makes some sense. You know, there's different, there's slightly different variations of how you could do this. So if my code doesn't make exact sense, hopefully the theory behind why this is the solution that we're approaching is better, is informative at least. Um, and then at the end, you just return d of negative one. Index out of boundary error. That's the problem with this problem is like, even if you understand the, not semantics, but you understand the theory, you understand how to approach it. Th there's some weird off one errors and like, okay, if K is here, so you may need to really sit down and think through, okay, if IDX is this and JDX is this, what's my solution? And that can sometimes be the most difficult part of dynamic programming, right? You have the right idea, but just coding it such that you're not like one off um, that can be difficult and just via practice it becomes more approachable okay so for example this is not right because this is saying my solution is 24 when it most definitely is not Okay, so this is weird. So let's um, let's print D. Just 
to make sure everything is top notch. Kind of embarrassing. This is wrong, but again, like I said. So if K is two, this is one, index one. This three is correct, right? Because it's just by itself. This should be 14, not 24. So where is it getting 24 from? Oh, okay. Okay, I see what's happening. So D of index updates, although this is right, right? There's no negative one value here. So it's wrapping around. So maybe we should, yeah, what if it wraps around too far? No, because it never wrap around more than the last element. Okay. So let's say D is the solution for this index. And then we'll say D equals the maximum. So we'll set D here the same way as negative float infinity. And then we'll update D here. We're going to end up doing this anyways because there's something else I wanted to show you guys. Um, and then we'd say D at the IDX equals D here. Okay. Because it's going to pull values from the previous iteration. So if you're on the last element, it might wrap around. So yeah, there you go. So the time complexity, space complexity, so let's say n equals length of the array, n. For time, right, we have to go through each element in the array, so we have to go through all n elements, and then we have to go all k, all k away to our left, right, because we have to look at every k partition point to our left. So this is going to take, for each n elements, we have to look at k things. So that's going to be big O of n times k. And then for space, well, I create an array that's uh, that's the length of R, so that's N. And then there's just a few variables that we update accordingly. So that's big O of N. Now, K and N are, you know, if you look at the description here, right, K is always less than or equal to N. So K is likely, K can never be larger than N, right? You can never have a K value that's larger than N. So you might as well... Um, so k is most likely going to be significantly less than n, depending on the system that you have, right? So you can actually make this system O of k time if you make this k plus 1 away. And then you don't even need to consider your distance in terms of d. You would just update d and k time here by saying D equals removing the first thing, because that's the oldest thing in your system, plus this new value of D. So now you have a O of K space solution, and since K is likely less than N, it's going to be in more cases. Since K is always less than or equal to N, it's most likely, it's mostly less than N, so then this is gonna have less space in the long term. So K is a better space variable to use, because it uses less space. Um, so yeah, and why can you do this? Because you only look at the previous k values, right? When I do a partition, I just have to look at the previous k things to make a determination about my partition. So I don't need to uh, consider anything else otherwise. All right, guys, that's it for this solution. Hopefully that makes some sense. This is definitely a more difficult problem. All right, bye.